Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, whenever you are um, feeling a need to buy something, you are confronted with a problem and you have to make a decision. So what are you usually doing when making a decision? I would need the slides now to show you. First of all, you are identifying the problem and you know, you think about what your goals are. What would you like to buy and how does it need to look like? Um, in that case, you first define the decision criteria. You decide what attributes, what characteristics the goal or the product you're uh, wishing for should have. You weigh the criteria, you think what, which criteria, which attributes are necessary, which ones are less important, etc. So you establish in your mind a kind of, um, well, form of the optimal solution, of the optimal outcome or the optimal option. Then usually people would go and look for alternatives which are available on the market. They look what, I, um, what, I, what characteristics these uh, alternatives have. They evaluate them according to the standard which you have set up before. You select the best alternative and you purchase and after having bought, you evaluate the decision process. You might find out that you, you really went for the best choice. That's great. You might find out that uh, perhaps you made some mistakes and you will correct your decision-making process in the future. That's usually what we think happens in important decisions. When people buy something really important for them, they are uh, looking for the reasonable object. They are trying to make uh, rational decisions according to the traditional economic model and they are trying to maximize their utility. Let's imagine that you are uh, buying three products, one for five, one for 10, one for 15 euros. You arrive at the cashier, how much do you have to pay? 35, that's correct, that's great. And I'm sure you know multiplying 10 by 10, how much that makes? 100. A bet and the ball together cost 110. The bet costs 100. What about the cost of the ball? 10. You're great. And this is what Shakespeare told us already. He has Hamlet saying that we are the wonder of, of the world, actually. We are a piece of work. What a piece of work is man, noble in reason, etc., etc. We are like a god. So that's really great. And we do know that. We know that we are great. There was a colleague of mine, an economic psychologist as well, who had uh, um, currency traders um, indicating how successful they are in their job. So he asked them to indicate on a scale from one to seven how they think about how successful they are in their job. What he found was that about 75% think they are really great, better than average. Only one-fifth of them thought, well, they're not doing like the average does, but a little worse. So in other words, when you're going uh, for consultation and you meet 15 uh, currency traders, ask for advice, it's really hard to get one who is below average. It's only one um, uh, r relative to 14 who are better than average. Well, since we are so great, let me continue with these tasks. Um, you see here a train which moves in one direction. Not only are you good in math, as we saw before, but you can also change the world as you like. Make it that the train goes in the opposite direction now. Can you see it's going in the opposite direction? If you want, just your will is enough to change the world. Now have it go in, in, the, third, in the first direction again. You can change as you, as you like. We are really great. Well, let's do another task. You take a wellness holiday for two people with a massage, and altogether it costs 900 euros. The holiday without a massage costs 700 more than the massages. How much do the massages cost? 200. Perfect. Uh, no. It's 100, it says here. No, no, not for each. 
the massages plural. Yeah. yeah. So what happens? Is it 100 or 200? 200? 100? Well, no. It's 100 because the holiday costs 700 more. So, so it's it's not No. Both. Each massage is 50. The difference is 700 now, from 100 to 900. The, the holiday without massage costs 700 more. It's the more. Did I make a mistake? Well, but what have we done now? We have shifted from the intuitive system, where you gave me at the beginning very intuitive answers, to the analytical one. You started thinking, right? It took energy now. In the, f in the first task, you were very quick. Now you became slow. So in psychology, we would say, I have to recalculate it. So you make me think again. In psychology, we would say there are at least two systems of processing information. There's the intuitive one, the system one, and perhaps you have read Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman. The system one, the intuitive system, the quick one, which is a self-evident, very emotion or effect-based system, and there's system two, the analytical system, which is slow, but evidence-based, takes time, takes energy, so we think in these both modes. And what is important is that in the system one mode, the solution is usually self-evident. And once we have a solution which is self-evident, we are not looking back at how we reached the solution and whether it is really correct or not, whether it's really the correct one or not the correct one. Well. In the evidence-based mode, you would be able to say what, what, what was really going on. So in other words, when we are taking decisions, we are taking intuitive ones or analytical ones, and that makes a difference. But also in the analytical mode, we can make mistakes. We can mistake, make mistakes and not go back to look for the correct solution. Now let me start from the beginning. I was talking about rationality and utility maximization as the benchmark in decision-making theory. What I would like to show you in the next minutes is that sometimes we make mistakes. Some of these mistakes are random. That's not really a problem when you look at the aggregated level of behavior on the market. But in other occasions, we make mistakes which are systematic. When mistakes are systematic, we call them biases. And biases would not average out on the aggregated level. So you would see them and observe them also on the marketplace, where you don't talk about individual behavior per se, but about the behavior of the market or indices. So I would like to bring a few examples about systematic errors with regard to perception, calculations, abbreviations, which we take in decision-making situations, the so-called heuristics, which we are using due to motivation, which is not always really high to look for the whole information which would be available. Sometimes we lack our cognitive abilities to do a proper job, proper calculations. We lack energy or time, and therefore we have to take a quick decision. Well, let me start with the optical illusions as distortions in the perception processes. You probably all know this illusion, the Müller-Lühr illusion, which says that, or shows that there are two lines which are equal in length. I don't change anything with regard to the length. I just change the context. And if you want or do not want, you perceive the lines different in length. And if you look in the, um, in the web, uh, there are many examples for optical illusions which could be already used to design 
the architecture in which people make choices. So the knowledge about optical illusions could be al already used in, in the nudging industry, if you so want. I found a funny application. If you don't want that your friends enter your home too quickly, just use possibilities uh, to design the floor. And you will see they slow down. And you could do or use these optical illusions in many circumstances. Sometimes in negotiations, sometimes you will find that you're in disagreement, in strong disagreement with your partners, and everybody is very convinced about his position and his arguments. Well, depending from which side you see a problem, a task, it might well be that the information which you get leads you to different opinions, to different standpoints. Look at this. How many planks do you see here? Three or four. But there is no correct answer. Should be easy, but it's not easy in that case. It's an optical illusion. But besides optical illusions, which give us some insight about how people perceive and afterwards behave in specific situations, we also have sometimes difficulties to make very easy tasks. Try please here to count the Fs in the text which is in the frame. How many Fs do you see? Four. Who sees four? Who counts four? Who counts six? Who three? Three. Who five? Well, shall we discuss this? <laughs> it's not a very difficult task, but what happens? What are you doing? Why do we count three? Who counted three Fs? Well, let's try. Finished, there's one. All right? Files, there's a second one. The result of, of, yeah? And there's another off and a third off. So six is correct. But what happens? <clears throat> it's actually not difficult. But you focus your attention to the important words, to the important parts of the information. And you, well, don't look at what is l less or least important, whatever. You, you omit this information. And if you again look at the internet, you will find nice videos uh, on selective information processes, which even if you see, a, when, when you see a movie, even you have a gorilla coming in the room shown on this movie, you are not aware that there's a gorilla coming in afterwards. You would say, or in testimony, there was none. Because your information is focused on specific thoughts, spots depending on your uh, motivation depending on, on your goals. The other effects which, we, which are used sometimes to tell people what they want. There's this famous decoy effect. Then Ariely did a study on The Economist, the magazine. The Economist advertised subscriptions <coughs> either online or print. Online subscriptions would cost $59 annually. Print, 125 In this study, which I really did, 68% of the people, of the subjects, decided to use the online version. They all have a tablet. They can read the economist whenever and wherever they want. So the preference is definitely <coughs> for the online version. Now, what did the economists do to have people deciding for the print version. They added an option which has no meaning. Well, it has a meaning, a psychological meaning. It had a relevant, important meaning because it helped people to find out what they want. See, they decided to sell the sub subscription online for 59 or print for 125 or Third option now, print and online for 125. 
all the students in this uh, example, in this experiment, were able to read and therefore to decide not to buy the offer print for 125. But you see now the preference reversal. 84% go for the combined print and, on, um, print and online version. It's the third alternative, which nobody chooses, and therefore you would conclude it's not important. But this, this, this alternative is important to help people knowing what, what is profitable, where they get the highest benefit of. So preference reversals, um, um, reversals uh, misperceiving information, miscalculating, miscounting, etc. That's what we usually and often observe when a situation, when a, when a, a decision situation is quite complex. And when you're more or less in the intuitive mode to take an option. And maybe a basic math, math course would help most consumers, but not only the consumers. I found this in these advertisements and I found them quite uh, interesting. They help you to, t to calculate that if you buy one, it's 12 euros. But if you buy, buy two for 15, you save three. So really great. <clears throat> And there is more. Sometimes it's just the mode in which the recipient is or uh, the, 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 the perspective which you take, which makes you understand things which were not, in, not intended. Now, from all that knowledge and more in cognitive psychology and especially in social and economic psychology, we know that sometimes people in a situation where they lack motivation to look for all the information which would be necessary to take an optimal decision, an optimal choice, or they lack the energy, or they lack the time, or the cognitive abilities, in all this knowledge which has been accumulated in these different subdisciplines of psychology can be used to help people in the intuitive mode to find out the better solution just intuitively, just to do the better automatically, the better, whatever the better is, assuming that we know what the better is. And this knowledge has recently been collected in and, and uh, advertised, I would say, by Cass Sunstein and um, Richard Taylor in a book which, with the title Nudge. He chose the elephant with the baby, the, the, the mother gives the baby a, a, a nudge in order to help to find the water pot. If the baby wants, it goes to the water and drinks. If, he's not, if it's not uh, thirsty, no problem. You can change your behavior. It's just a nudge which you are giving to help find out the better solution. Now, this knowledge, behavioral insights, have been used um, or can be used to regulate people's behavior. Usually we know that, uh, that behavior is regulated either by communicating, by informing people, which are very liberal ways, liberal strategies to inform people and have them changing their behavior. Often they don't really work as you would expect. Or you become more paternalistic in this case, you use orders, law, etc., and tell people what they have to do. You control their behavior and you find them if they are not obeying the law. Now, nudging is a possibility to be liberal paternalistic, a bit more liberal, I would say, than all the other methods which you find here on the right side of the screen. Okay, political instruments. Are we really allowed to use these behavioral insights? Is it really ethical to use them or not? Shall we tell people, shall we regulate the behavior according to the lawyer's insights, or can we nudge? Is nudging manipulation, and is that ethically acceptable? Well, I would say that if you're behaving in a very rational way, nudging would not have an effect anyway, because whatever, how in whatever way you 
design a choice architecture. The rational human would consider all the options, all the characteristics of the options, and take the best one, or at least an optimal one. However, those who are error-prone, those who make systematic mistakes, so-called biases, they might benefit from the way you're designing the choice architecture. And these insights and the, 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 the assumption that the people in the intuitive mode, error-prone people, might benefit from how you design the choice situation have led to the establishment of behavioral insight units all over the world in very many countries and in many organizations as well so far. The, perhaps the most, the best known unit is the behavioral insight unit uh, in, in UK. They collected the information in social psychology and economic psychology and behavioral economics, etc. <coughs> and categorized the mechanisms which influence our behavior into a, a, a system which is called the EAST system. E-A-S-T, the anacronym which means that you should make choices easy. You should make it easy for people to reach the goal which you think or people think are the best ones for themselves. You should make the goals attractive. You should communicate about the behavior of other people. So show, social aspects are important. And consider when you are going to inform, to inform people about something. So time is also an important aspect. In other words, easy means that if you want people to do something, make sure that there are no hindrances on the way to do the job. If you want people not to do something, then think about obstacles, but don't prohibit the behavior, the non-intended behavior. Otherwise, you regulate by law. Attract means that <coughs> you have to look at the attention of people. What is the attention spotlight? You saw when counting the Fs. The spotlight of your attention, <coughs> sorry, the spotlight of your attention can be directed to some aspects, but not to all, which would be relevant in a specific situation. People are strongly influenced by what others are doing. So social norms are very important. And finally, time is important and the way you frame an issue. Sometimes <coughs> a topic is framed as a loss. The same topic could be framed as a gain. You could sell a glass of water, a glass which is half, half full or half empty. Well, objectively, there is no difference. But in the perception, there is a difference. In one situation, you lead the attention to the winning situation. In the other situation, to loss. And depending on loss, or gain, people's risk behavior seems to be quite different. So let me bring a few examples about easy, attractive, social, and timely. Easy. <coughs> the best known, I think the best known picture is the fly in the urinal. Half of the group here, of the audience, know what I mean. At the airport in Amsterdam, in Schiphol, they saw that when you use this uh, figure of a fly, the cleaning costs go down up to 80% <laughs> in the men's toilets. That's a nudge. In Paris, when you use the metro, you can use the ticket from four sides. The machine is always able to read the ticket. So it's very quick that you pass by. In Austria, in many uh, uh, parking garages, people try to open the doors by using the ticket without looking at the arrow 
which shows which is the right side of the ticket to insert in the machine. They just try, they don't look. You have four possibilities. It's very hard that you find the right one at the very beginning if you don't look. So why don't we design machines which can read from all four sides of the ticket? Recently, I learned about the nudge in the Netherlands. When you're going to the to, 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 um, uh, driving um, trainings, people train you to open the door when driving with the, with the right hand. And they are able to reduce bicycle incidents significantly. Why? If you tell people to look back when you're opening the door, you've told them, but they don't do it or forget about doing it, especially when there's not much time left, when they are in a hurry. But if they are trained automatically to open the door with the right hand, they turn around and see whether there's a bike uh, in the net or not. You have to observe what people do and think whether what they do is reasonable or whether you can make the choice architecture different so that they automatically do the better for themselves and for the community. A colleague of mine told me recently that they did a project on airports and they found out that older people are very often going to the toilet. Do you guess why? Have an idea why they would go to the toilet so often? And not only do they go to the toilet very frequently, but they are always staying close to the toilets. They were observing these people and they found out they don't use the toilet. They don't even wash their hands there. What are they doing? They're going to the toilet when, when an announcement is coming on the airport. They go to the toilet because it's silent there. They can understand what is said. Yeah. And outside in the hall, there's too much noise. Yeah. So if you don't observe, you would probably be misled by guessing that whatever these people do, you have to help them in a way would be the wrong one. So observing people is necessary to learn about their behavior, the drivers of behavior, the motives of their behavior. And once you know, you can make it easy for them to do what they should do. The best way to make things easy is using status quo effects. Defaults. We all know about the power of defaults. Opt-out ruling takes energy, takes time. So why not design in a situation in a way that people opt out only to do what is less preferable? We have in Austria 99.98% organ donators. Similar numbers in Belgium, France, etc the blue bars are very high and show the countries in which the status quo is that you're an organ donator unless you opt out. In Germany, it's about 15% nowadays. The attitudes of people in Austria and in Germany are equal with regard to organ donations. So the preferences do not differ between the two countries. It's just a default situation which makes this huge difference. In the Netherlands, astonishingly, they reached about 27.5% uh, organ donators. They had to opt in as well. But those people opted in after having been informed four times that they should finally go and do it. Yeah. So why not just changing the situation, the default situation? Sometimes it makes miracles. I thought that perhaps if you do, is it the correct patient disposal, patientenverfügung? Hmm? You don't know? You know what I mean? <laughs> patient disposition, yeah. In Austria, if you want to have a patient disposition, you have to go to the, to the lawyer, to the notary. It takes time, it takes money, it takes energy, and then it's valid, it would be valid for five, no, eight years now. And then you have to renew the whole stuff. In, a, 
in a situation where most people prefer the patient disposition. In a country where health costs are going up, why not changing the situation, the default situation in that case? So you see, a lot has been done with organ donation. I don't know whether you're in favor or not, but you can opt out if not. But there is more left to do if one wants. Anyway, when you nudge, you should nudge in a way that the so-called manipulation is transparent, that people know they are nudged. It should be easy to do the opposite of what the nudger wants you to do. And nudging needs to be in favor of the community or the individual, the nudged person. That's quite important. That's what the authors of Nudge, Sunstein and Thaler, emphasize repeatedly. Now, I found here a way to nudge people. When you um, book a flight, you can buy services. I usually click on the big black button saying yes, and then I have a hard time to go back on these pages to find Weiter on a red service. Yeah? The, op the, the, the other option, which I actually prefer. So in that case, nudging would be misleading. It's manipulation in that case. As that make it easy if you want people to do something. And make it difficult if you want people not to do something. Frictions are sometimes used to um, prevent people from to do something which is undesirable. There was a funny episode in Germany in 1980 where this, they discovered a friction. At that time, they introduced um, uh, spot fines on motorcycles not wearing helmets. And they observed that the, uh, the, 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 the theft of motorcycles was going down by 60% at the same time. Why is that the case? Because stealing a motorcycle was not easy anymore. A thief had to steal a helmet or bring a helmet with him before. Yeah? So that's meant by frictions in the process. This would be a friction. Again, an optical illusion. You will see car drivers slow down once they approach these figures. Optical illusions are used a lot. For example, this illusion. The two inner circles are equal in size. The diameter doesn't change. But it's the context which makes you perceive the one on the left side bigger than the one on the, on the right side, right? <laughs> OK, what would that mean if you serve food on the buffet? Yeah? If you use big plates, Food waste is incredibly high, usually. Yeah? If redu you reduce the size of the plate, people can eat as much as they want. They can go back and carry food as much as they want, repeatedly. Nobody leaves the buffet hungry. But the waste is going down, because it, usually people don't take more than they can eat. So for example, in this, in this study, Green nudge found out that a two inch smaller diameter resulted in 20% resulted in, uh, less food waste. What's happening here? Sasha, you have to go back to the presentation. Anyway, these are a few examples about easy, about making it easy. The next examples, examples would be on attraction. We have learned that there is a spotlight filter, so to say, with the, our, the, uh, our attention is directed. In advertising, decades ago, they found out that 95 to 98% of the information is just wasted. It's lost. So most of the information is even not arriving to the recipient. These insights have been used in, in Copenhagen in, um, to reduce waste on the street. A colleague there 
observed that this foot steps help people finding out where they can get rid of the, of the waste. And they reduced the waste by 45%. So in the littering policy, this is quite an important possibility which doesn't cost much, but regulates people's behavior considerably. You can use funny designs to help people what is better for the community. That was, I think that was a nice one. Uh, usually on highways you find that people just throw the litter out of the window and it's very costly to clean. Yeah? But if you use these uh, gates every 50 kilometers, let me say, or 80, people collect the litter because they try the game. Yeah? So you use games in designing choices, choice architecture. I found this one also quite nice. Could England win the, the rugby cup, yes or no? People vote. Yeah? But while voting, which is their goal, they do something which you want them to do. <clears throat> Attention is important. It has been observed that people in the cafeteria eat what is next to them. So if you put the unhealthy food next to them on the, on the buffet, <clears throat> you will see that unhealthy food is consumed much less. <clears throat> if you put the, 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 the vegetable, the salad in front of the people and they have to go for the meat, vegetable and salad is consumed much more likely. But you see, everybody has the possibility to change the behavior. Everybody is free to choose what he or she wants. And that's important. That's an important characteristic of nudging in relative to manipulation. <clears throat> Government dinners should be vegetar vegetarian by default. Whoever wants to have meat makes a choice, etc., etc. Many possibilities. You could also use entertainment. If you want to reduce <clears throat> energy costs, one could learn from this Swiss uh, company. They used the display on the shower <coughs> with a small ice beer. And the more hot water you consume, the more this ice is melting. So at the end, the poor bear is falling in the water. Wouldn't you try to consume as much that you just keep him safe? Yeah. <coughs> in, uh, in, in tax psychology, we found out that when people sign the form, the filing, when they file and sign before entering all the, the numbers in the form, they sign at the beginning that they will report honestly compliance is higher than when they si sign at the end, saying that everything they said and indicated is true. Yeah? Because you immediately ask for the commitment. And once people are committed, they stick with the behavior which they promise. Feedback is important if you want people to save energy. How do you know how much energy you're consuming at, at home if you don't have feedback or a reminder that you should do it or this funny way to show how South Africa becomes black if you use too much paper. So see, the, the whole stuff is easy, attention, fun, motivation related. If you want people to use the stairs, make design the stairs in a, funny vi in a funny way, like the piano. And you see that they try out to use the new stair rather than being carried up. In London, they observed that if you uh, have advertisements with baby faces in dark streets, in, uh, in, in areas where violence has been observed, that people become, or the violence goes down. 
I'm not sure whether I do believe all these reports in that area, but it seems that baby faces make you more friendly. If you don't want to tell anything, just show people how much sugar they consume by taking one of the soft drinks. You don't have to tell them, you don't have to prohibit anything. People learn, people see, and they make a free choice. The fourth category of nudges relates to social. Social norms are very important. Usually, we orient our behavior on the behavior of others. So putting a sign next to the elevator telling people that most people use the stairs, it should be true, by the way, what you're saying. But telling people that is quite effective. Most people will at least take a moment and think, well, shall I use the stair or not? So that's something which you could use also in, in small organizations, in business organizations, for example. In UK, right at the beginning, when establishing the behavioral insight uh, team, they did a letter study. They wrote to people that it's time to file taxes and they should do it punctually and honestly. And they added a sentence in which they said, in our country, I don't know, 85%, pay correctly, timely, honestly. In another condition of this field experiment, people were told, in our city, people are honest, that, that many people are honest. Or people who run a business like yours are filing correctly, etc. What they found was that this costless sentence, this small sentence, had a huge impact on the aggregated level on people's compliance. Because if you see that the majority of others are doing something, you have to find a justification for not doing it. Yeah? And when you communicate compliance, for example, don't tell people that only 5% are not compliant, because that already orients your attention towards non-compliance. Imagine that you go to the doctor, you arrive late, and you find um, uh, an indication that um, only 10% of the patients come late. Wouldn't you be happy not to be the only one to be late? Yeah. And wouldn't you try to be punctual next time when he, instead of saying only 5% come late, if he said 95% are here on time. Yeah. It's the same information, but the framing is different. The social aspect is communicated in a different way. Use of towels in, in, uh, um, in hotels, etc., is an important um, issue in, ecological, um, in, in the ecological area. And what, what you find is that in hotels, people are using towels more than once if there's an indication that that saves whatever. If, however, on these indications it says, if you reuse the towel, we uh, pay a charity for a charity organization, 20 cents for each reused towel, People reciprocate this favor. If you tell people that, I know, 75% of people using the same category of rooms reuse the towel, you increase the percentage even more. So telling people about what others are doing is important, but be aware about how you frame the social norm that you're communicating. That's what it says on this slide. The fourth category relates to time. <clears throat> if you want people to do something, think about when to communicate that they have to do it. When is it the right time? Two weeks before the behavior should be shown, th three weeks before, but it's not enough to communicate once and it's done. So timely is important. And this is a category which also refers 
to gain and loss situations. And I found uh, a study which I think was quite nice and shows how winning and losing are perceived, how losses are, uh, uh, shows that indeed losses loom much larger than gains. If I give you 100 euros, you're happy. But if I take it back, the 100 euros, once they are yours, you don't feel like you felt before getting the money, but you feel much worse. So it seems that losses loom twice as much as gains. Yeah. Well, if that is true, then we would try to avoid losses at all possible costs, right? We would take risks to avoid losses. Yeah. While we are not really risk seeking in a gain situation. Now in this study, they were looking at how much people eat. In one condition, they got the pizza, a very simple one, just some cheese and tomato. But they, were, they had the possibility to add whatever they wanted. Bacon and another portion of cheese and whatever. Yeah. And you see, they spent in this experiment 2.7, 3.2 dollars for the pizza. In the other condition, in this fake, in this laboratory restaurant, they got the pizza with everything on the top. But you could tell you don't want, I don't know, bacon, you don't want this kind of cheese, you don't, well, you scale down. Scaling down led to the du double expenditure. Because in one situation, you're in a gain situation. You think about whether you need it. In the loss situation, you, you, you suffer. You don't want lo to lose. And therefore, you consume almost the double as in the other situation. Okay, there are many more examples for nudging. But sometimes nudging really goes a little bit too far, I think. There was one study, the safeguard germ alarm. In a toilet, people heard an alarm when leaving the toilet if they had not previously, previously used the soap spender. Yeah. They had to go back, otherwise the alarm did not stop. <laughs> yeah. I don't know whether that is really the elegant way, the noble way, to nudge. Anyway, to conclude, nudges have to be, have to follow ethical norms. It is not persuasion, it's not manipulation like we know it, for example, from advertisement. However, it's very similar and the techniques are not really different. But the, it's necessary that nudging is transparent. It's necessary that you can do the opposite behavior. You can escape easily. And the goal must be to ben, uh, that you nudge for the benefit of the nudged, of the individual, or of the community. In any way, when you think about nudging, about using behavioral insights, it's important, I think, to observe what people do in certain situations, to think or study the motivation behind their behavior, to understand the context in which they behave, and then you build your intervention. And don't forget to evaluate the intervention and to adapt it, to change it if necessary. So in essence, what I was saying was that successful choice architecture makes it easy to pursue the goals. Attraction plays a role. Goals should be attractive. Other behavior impacts on your own behavior, social norms are important, and the timing and framing of communication is important. Whatever you do, when you're not, try to do it in a way which is really helpful. Thank you very much.